Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God, our Heavenly Father, and from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The theme for our meditation this day is entitled, The Lord Added to the Church. It's based on the first lesson for today from Acts chapter 2. Here again, that word of God. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all, as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So far, our text. Dear friends in Christ Jesus, <clears throat> earlier in this chapter, we have the Pentecost Sermon of St. Peter. A pattern for our true Christian preaching, Peter takes the people to task for their sinfulness. He tells them, you crucified the Lord of glory. You're the one who rejected the Son of God. You are under the condemnation of God's wrath. But then he opened the door to heaven for them by inviting them to repent, that is to turn away from their sinfulness, and to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, to be baptized, every one of them, and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he assured them of the Lord's mercy and grace when he tells them the promise is not only for you, but it's for your children, and it's for all who the Lord our God will call. Now we see the result of God's mercy. We see the foundation and beginning of the Holy Christian Church there in Jerusalem, gathered around word and sacraments, celebrating, rejoicing in the fact that Jesus, who was crucified for the sins of the whole world, rose from the dead and gives hope and life to all those who follow. It's a simple proclamation in our text today, but it's been used before also in this chapter. The Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. It's God who does that work. It's God who builds his church. St. Paul had another way of saying it when he wrote to the Corinthians. No man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Spirit. The fact that we have faith in our believers in Jesus Christ owes not to our intelligence, not to our abilities, but to God's grace and mercy. He is the one who deserves glory because he saved his people. You see, we're not really any different than those people who had clamored for the crucifixion of Jesus. Lost in sin, we came into this world, dead in our trespasses, enemies of God, and left to our own device, we would be gleeful and delight in the ways of the devil, the world, and our sinful flesh. But God confronts us. God gets in our face, as it were, and says to us, you are sinners. You deserve eternal wrath. You deserve my righteous damnation. But then he opens the door of heaven to us. He invites us in repentance to believe on his son, and through mercy and grace, he washes away our sins and gives us the gift of everlasting life. That's God's work of grace. And not only that, but he keeps us on the pathway of everlasting life. This God who builds his church, this God who is gracious and merciful, this God who cares so deeply about us, that not only did he send his son to be our savior, but he constantly by his spirit working faith in our hearts, strengthens that faith by word and sacrament, and keeps us on the pathway of life everlasting. 
the work of a shepherd that Jesus does in the life of his disciples, those who had forsaken him, those who had scattered, those who certainly must have counted themselves worthy of God's condemnation, just like the ones who had clamored for crucifixion. This shepherd Jesus, the resurrected Lord, goes to them, shows himself alive, assures them, this is why I came, to die for sin, your sin. And he invites them to follow after him, calls them to be his ambassadors, his emissaries, and assures them that his grace and mercy will be with them. Because God desires nothing less than to add to his church daily those who are being saved. And what are God's tools? We hear it in the Pentecost Sermon of St. Peter. We hear it in the command and commissioning our Lord gives to his church before he ascends into heaven. Go make disciples of all nations. Not by your wisdom. Not by your clever design. Not by your talents and abilities. Make disciples by means of baptizing. By means of teaching them all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Those are the tools that God uses. Word and sacrament. That's the way he has promised to build his church. That's how he brought you into his church. In the waters of holy baptism, he washed away your sin. In the waters of holy baptism, he made you his child. In the waters of holy baptism, he promised you eternal salvation. And as we daily remember that baptism in contrition, that is sorrow over sin, in repentance, that is the desire with the help of the Holy Spirit to amend our sinful lives, we rejoice that we are assured each one of us is part of God's kingdom. Each one of us, as believers in Christ, have the promise of everlasting life. Each one of us is a cherished member of the Good Shepherd's flock that he desires to bring to himself and the safety of the sheepfold of everlasting life. It's a wonderful thing to gather on Sundays and to praise and give glory to the resurrected Lord. It's a wonderful thing to hear once again, our sins are forgiven and that we have everlasting life. Because as we go about our daily tasks, day to day, week to week, month to month, year to year, and life in this world passes by, we may lose sight of the fact that God is doing his work all the time. That's such an important concept from our text today. And God added daily to his church. Every day, in every place that the gospel is shared, God works his work. It's none other than what the prophet Isaiah talks about. That the word of the Lord goes forth and it always accomplishes the purpose for which it is sent. Oh, sometimes we get frustrated and disappointed because we don't think that our sharing of the gospel and that our preaching of the good news, our witnessing to our neighbors and friends that it's just not happening fast enough. That the church just isn't getting big enough that we can visibly measure what's taking place. There's a, a temptation in that frustration. 
to think that our work is more important, that we are doing the right thing when we see numbers increase. And we are tempted to pat ourselves on the back because we have accomplished great things. But let us be warned that to count our strength, to number our ability, brings God's disdain and wrath. Remember King David, who took a census of the people, who began to measure what was happening in the nation of Israel in that manner, and he patted himself on the back because of the strength of his army and the numbers of his people, only because of his pride and his arrogance to bring a plague upon that nation because the death of many people. No, let us not strip God of his rightful glory and praise, but let us recognize that it's the Lord who adds to his church. And though we may be laborers in the work as God has sent us to do, we will be like as the apostle describes, one planting, one watering, one seeing the harvest. In knowing that whenever the gospel is shared, and wherever it is shared, the Holy Spirit is working through that word to do the work of God. There he is, converting unbelievers to faith. There he is, ripping people out of eternal death and onto the pathway of everlasting life. There he is working his grace and mercy to bring to bear the full import of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ in the life of sinners. That they might be added to Christ's church. And that by God's gracious work might have the gift of everlasting life. Because we can see throughout all of the scriptures, it's God's great pleasure to build his kingdom. It's God's great pleasure wherever the word is shared to convert people to faith and to bring them to eternal life. And so even though we might be discouraged in our work of evangelism, we might grow frustrated that we don't see this magnificent jump of numbers gathering in God's kingdom, we continue to steadfastly faithfully and steadily do the work of the kingdom. And thus, who knows what lives we might impact simply by sharing the message of Jesus Christ with others. It's why evangelism and missions in the church are an important thing whether it be in our homes, whether it be in our community, whether it be in our nation, whether it be on shores far away from us, we support that preaching of the gospel, that teaching, that day after day after day after day, sharing of the good news of Jesus Christ. Because by those means, God builds his church. There are certainly those who have pondered this idea that this power of God that is demonstrated through the death and resurrection of his son and the work of building the kingdom is turned over to a bunch of individuals who didn't have great education who didn't have extraordinary talents, who didn't seem to be competent many times throughout the ministry of Jesus, as they didn't understand what he was doing, as they argued amongst themselves. And yet look what has taken place. Look what has taken place. From the simple, humble sharing of the gospel person to person, opportunity to opportunity, look at what God has done. 
in his world. There are Christians all over the face of the earth because somebody, somewhere, faithfully told the story, shared with them the good news. And in that gospel, the Holy Spirit works and God continues to add to his church. It's quite a transformation. It all is founded upon and begins with that steadfast adherence to the doctrine and teaching of the apostles. That is, they are sharing what they heard from the lips of Christ with believers. It centers around, in the first part of our text, it says the breaking of bread. That is the celebration of the Lord's Supper. And it multiplies itself to Christian relationships where those who were believers were less concerned about the worldly things, less concerned about their own selves, and more concerned about those in God's creation. Caring for one another, praying for one another, sharing with one another for those who had need. And that phrase used again, breaking of bread from house to house, most likely means that they gave thanks to God for their daily bread, the gifts that God had given them. They received them with thanksgiving. They used them as good stewards of what God had blessed them with. And they knew that they, those gifts of God were there to take care of them and to support the preaching of the gospel and the sharing of the good news with others. Because what was most important in their lives was not amassing great wealth. It was not following the philosophy of the world. But it was seeing that the good news of Jesus Christ was shared with others. In the history of this congregation, there have been many who have confessed their faith, who have died in the faith, and received the crown of glory. Why? Because people here continue to share the good news of Jesus with others. Is the work hard? Is the labor long? Always. It continues day after day against a world that is lined up against us, against the devil and his demons, against the temptations of the sinful flesh. But when God works through his gospel, in his sacraments, when God works in baptism, when God works in the Lord's Supper, when God works in the absolution, the world, the devil, and sinful flesh in all their power pale greatly in comparison to the Lord who adds to his church those who are being saved. You can't measure things always by numbers. You can't measure things always by success in the world. And as good-hearted as we may be as Christians, with our motivations to try and build the church to grow in numbers, there has been many a plan that has failed miserably because we didn't recognize one simple principle from Scripture. It's God who adds to his people, not us. All God has asked us to do is to be faithful, to share the good news, to worship, to live the life of faith as an example to others. And whether the church grows in number in one place or another, that's in the providence and work of the Almighty God. So let us rejoice in what God has done. Does our Lord Jesus Christ say to us, as soon as 
there are 50, as soon as there are 100, as soon as there are 1,000 who come to faith, there is great celebration and joy in heaven. No, he says, the angels of heaven rejoice. There's great celebration in heaven over one sinner who repents. Person by person, individual by individual, every day, the Lord, through word and sacraments, adds to his church those who are being saved. A wonderful the death and resurrection of Jesus is. It transforms sinners into saints. How wonderful the death and resurrection of Jesus is. It brings people out of death into everlasting life. So we share Jesus Christ in our homes, in our community, in our nation, in our world. And we leave the work of conversion and the work of salvation to God to whom it belongs, and for the work that he does, for our own salvation and the salvation of others, and for the growth of his church, we give thanks to God, and we praise him rightly, and look forward to the day when each individual who has been added to the church of God, each individual in whose hearts has been worked the gift of faith, each individual who has profited from the grace and mercy of Christ's sacrifice and resurrection, with you, with me, gathers in heaven eternally to praise the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.